I met a man on a building ledge. I asked him, Hey, mister, what the hell are you doing up here? He said, I'm jumping. And he did. I admired his sense of purpose. He had a concrete goal and the perseverance to obtain his stated objective. Most people don't have these attributes and you really need them to succeed in life. <laughs> Vignette. Right. But now I have a different vision of coughing through the settling smoke, of scalded skin and flayed bone, of burnt wood and smashed cement, of accusations and condemnations, of hanging trees and choking gasps. The Revolutionary Army has won the war. A new world proclaims its birth. I fear the labor pains. <laughs> On January 1st, 9.30 a.m. a year ago, I looked out at the harbor, the dock cranes, water, ships, and skyscrapers, all motionless. A year ago, I looked out, looked out at this promenade, wondering what I'd be doing in exactly one year. The ex-champ in armor of rags brags about his comeback. His name will again be spoken. He challenges. I'll take you all on again. Then he falls to the floor. The cop's gun still smoking inch forward. They search, find his worn wallet inside his wrinkled ID, as legible as faded markings on a turned over tombstone. An oasis saved man with a full belly lounges by the water hole in the shade of date palms. He watches his camel rest contentedly, but soon, not being a camel. The drone-like scraping of wind over sand bores his ears. He walks to Eden's border, but there at the perimeter extends sameness, bare and blazing. He hesitates, traveling close into cliffs. Jack, I truck, dead ahead, myself six years old, maybe even seven. My father's hands were firm on the wheel, hurtled toward the dashboard. No seat belts back then, but arms folded, cushioned my face. Could feel the cold glass windshield almost touching me, swerved around a careening truck, but eyes were fixed, fixed on my father's firm hands, gripping the wheel, gripping it, gripping it. Masterful how he pumped the brakes, lurched the car, dan dance, rhythmic, cha cha cha, stop and go forward, off the road, through the fence, on the grass, by the rocks, to the cliffs, close, close, stop. Cliff, ominous, over, yawning, canyon. Then those seconds of terror passed, and the car was still, and the truck was still, yet both engines shuddered just shy of disaster. My heart seemed to fly out of my chest at those hands, my father's hands, finally let go of the wheel to reach out to me and grab my shoulder, pull me towards him and hug me, hug me, and before my eyes were his tight white knuckles those cutting edges of his fists, caressed, comforted, calmed my panicky heart. <laughs> Seeking a universally accepted prayer for public schools. What name to shout or oh, whisper? Allah, Hashem, Christ, Buddha, Great Spirit, and is the one humbled, and is one humbled by the presence of a corporeal or incorporeal being. If the metaphysical master is an amorphous unity with rocks, water, animals, and plants, then where is the familiar human face that's either smiling or angry? But when praying to a human face, then to whom is one praying? He, she, or them? In what direction does one pray? Up to distant heaven or down to intimate earth? Face the east and you turn from the west. Look to the north and ignore the south. What is the proper posture for prayer? Standing, sitting, kneeling, or prostrate? Should one be still or dance with arms hard, raised high? And to what music? Soft, new age, meditation, or hard rock, ecstatic? And with what instruments? Solemn pipes or 
wild drums. What attire is appropriate before one's divinity? Silk robes, sackcloth, business suit, newborn naked. Should one cover one's head or display it bare to heaven? But most searching of all, with whom should one pray? Hell, for are we not debating prayer in public school during homeroom attendance? With whom then? Kids should pray with fellow kids, of course. A congregation of mayhem, a worship of raucous religiosity, a grand glossolalia to a hundred personal dolmites, prayers that they won't be delivered unto science or math class till long after the late bell has pealed its ungodly summons. <laughs> skeleton key, skeleton key. Take off Clark Kent's glasses and assume x-rays and assume Superman's x-rays eyes. Kryptonite is an optical illusion, so feel free to find a deeper vision beneath black, white, red, yellow, brown, and perhaps even a tinge of blue. The articulations of bone speak of grace uh, in the harmonized movements of humerus with femur, of radius and ulna with tibia and fibula. See how the slender phalanges uncurl from the metacarpals when the hand reaches out to touch. Be awed at the towering strength of the spine, which holds the skull far from the ground and closer to the cosmos. Scan the arcade of ribs, those bellows of breath. Below is the pelvis, which holds up the framework like a wide supporting hand. And like the comic book hero, see beyond the clashing colors of skin, all the way to the awe of silvery bones running within, which as much as ligaments and tendons binds us all to the common vein of the body politique. For truth. The proof is in the pudding. But what does that mean exactly? 80%, 90%, 100% proof? I drink to that, then flop face down into the mushy mess. And what kind of pudding holds such dispositive evidence? Rum, vanilla, chocolate, bread, or perhaps tropical tapioca after the cyanide is boiled off? The old saw is a mangled adage. The actual 16th century proverb is, the proof of the pudding is in the eating. Ergo, the proof is in the pudding. It is not exactly the truth, the whole truth and nothing but. And to eat the pudding is to eat the proof. In short, you can't have your proof for need it too. Besides, a belly full of truth will bloat your stomach. And who wants to be near such a gas bag? what to do with truth that it's putting proof. You can sniff around it or observe its quivering nature, but if you open your big mouth and swallow, then you deny it to others just as hungry for it and who also believe they really want to taste the slimy concoction. Swallow truth and truth is within you, and thereafter you must be the mold and not the pudding that the mold shapes. The required accompanying cover letter. Dear editor, I'm no Hittite toady, no genuflecting, groveling supplicant, hugging the ground and bearing his back to serve as a carpet for some parading potentate's feet. I lick nobody's black boots. Unless it's Mistress Olga's in her luscious house of discipline. Nor am I a Fallen gladiator pleading for mercy before the financial backer of the game, the first editor, the Roman progenitor of your professional title. The arena may now be publishing, but the contests are just as bloody. Submit. 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 I should submit a manuscript so you could turn thumbs up or down. Never. Not this pen-wielding Spartacus. I don't submit to anyone and I'd sub to no one. And so, you nabob of the somewhat erudite, high priest of the semi-literate, Sharon of the slush pile, I'm not submitting to you, but accept my blessings and offer up prayers of thanksgiving <clears throat> that from an industry jam-packed with jaded eyes, I deign to pick yours 
to behold my immortal swivels. <laughs> Champion retires. Pity Goliath, scarecrow of the Philistines. Why chill that hit a thousand quaking men? Baal's champion, he made thunder on command. Skiff, skin tough as a shark's, nine feet tall. He was condemned never to look up at any man, even his king. Trotted out like a standard before every battle, he saved the hides of all the warriors who had wet their pants in secret. How many times did he answer the call? Hey, Goliath, front and center. Caught in the workaday rut of killing, how many times did he yell his carefully rehearsed threats? Never could his knees buckle, never could anyone see his sword vacillate in his trembling hand. And that shepherd boy approaching, just inches short of his long shadow, that shepherd boy. Surely Goliath must have seen the stones picked up. Surely he must have seen the sling swung in deadly circles. Surely he must have heard the rock switching up for Al's bad breath. Surely he had a lifetime of shunting spears and arrows with a fleck of his mighty shield. A shield that became too heavy to lift. Signing a song, and she danced, not to the music on the radio, but to the cadence, cadence of pulsating volume lights. She faced me, and her arms were in liquid flow, first crossed over her heart, then slowly down her sides, then up, when the lights briefly sojourned to red. She swayed her head, smiled at me, and again crossed her heart. The other party guests had told me she was deaf. I knew only one sign, crossed arms over the heart, which means love. Certainly not for me alone, but this was our first meeting. Crossed arms over the heart means love, and the lights then flickered serenely green. I couldn't translate her lyrics, her lyrics nor could she hear the melody. But her smile was universal. Universal. We held out our arms, embraced, and for the length of a song, danced to a shared rhythm. One more. One more. One more. Beethoven and breathing. But tonight, I left the radio on, and now I hear breathing, even when pausing my own. Beethoven in breathing. Clearly, no Beethoven lies next to me. But the breathing is real. Real and rhythmic, primal and soothing, like the pastoral. Something in the night, sometime in the night, my son found his way to my side. Perhaps he woke in his shadowy room, frightened by a bad dream or worse disillusioned by a good one. I hear my seven-year-old's heaving chest. Is he too old to be here? What does it matter? He's here. Maybe on some future cold sweat night when he's fully grown and alone like me, awake and tuned to Beethoven, he'll call for me. Thank you.